express yourself to him? If it's in a voice or a lifted hand or just a tear, could you just express yourself to him just for a minute? Any expression of desperation, any time we reach out to him, it's really all that matters. Maybe the next few moments that we spend together in his presence are the thing it is the thing that's going to carry you through. Maybe it's the only thing. Can we be full of his blessings and still hungry for more? desperate for food, she just didn't know it. Wesley, you're here and you just lost your mama last Sunday, just a couple hours from right now. You need a touch today. We're just proud you're here. We love you. I don't know what you're going through today, but whether you realize it or not, you are desperate. Just one more time before we get in his word, could you just take both your hands? you just pick us up today and hold us close for you. <laughs> One more time, if you just let me know that you still love me. One more time. Would you just whisper to me here one more time, Jesus? I just need to hear it one more time. sensitivities have been numbed. We have to come to a place like this and get very protected and get very focused before we even realize that there is a God, before we even realize that He does care about us because our spiritual sensitivities have been so dumbed down and so numbed. We're so caught up in the rat race and the chaos. The love of many, many, the scripture said, is wax cold. I have no idea why I'm going to preach what I'm about to preach, but it's been on my heart for the last couple of weeks. And it's totally, totally, totally doesn't fit, so I'm going to need your help. I have never in 28 years of preaching, and pa longer than that, preaching 28 years of pastoring, I've never done this before. Mark chapter number 9, verse number 43. 
Good to see you today on this rainy day. Hope you're glad to be here. I hope you didn't. If you left right now, you'd been blessed to be here, wouldn't you? So glad to be here. Uh, Katie, uh, my daughter-in-law, her mother's in the hospital today. Brother Wesley's mother, uh, visitation this afternoon at Griffin Leggett, North Little Rock, 4 to 6. Service tomorrow at 2 o'clock, I believe, at the same place. Uh, praying for Katie's mom today. Lots of needs, lots of people uh, hurting. I want to deal with reality because what we think is reality is not and what we think isn't is. Society has twisted things to the point that what we think is real really is just fading away. And what we don't even think about as real is really what is real. And so if I could read a passage from Mark chapter 9, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. I think the Bible's serious about sin. I don't see any single wings in here today. I don't see anybody with a cut off hand, but we all should. Everybody in the building probably should have cut off her hand if we believe that scripture. Can I get a witness? If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Why? Because it's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands and go to hell. Into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the, their worm does not die. And the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never, that's the third time he said, the fire shall never be quenched. It's the third time he said, where the worm does not die and the fire is not. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where their worm does not die in the fire. I've been pastoring for 28 years, and I'm so ashamed of myself. I've never one time preached about hell. One half of the parables deal with hell or eternal judgment. 1,870 verses in the Bible mention hell. God, help us to understand. I want to have a little reality shock here today for me us. Is that all right? Only a pastor that loves folks could preach this. So you got to understand I love you. I'd a whole lot rather do something different. But the enemy has blinded us and our spiritual sensitivities have been dulled to the point that hell is scoffed at. It's a curse word. It's a metaphor. It's the subject of jokes and comedians. But hell's not funny. Hell is real where the worm doesn't die and the fire never stops. I'm not here to laugh at it. And I'm not here to scoff at it. I'm here to acknowledge it. God bless you. You may be seated. Modern mankind laughs at the notion we have become, in our mind, we have become our own supreme being. We are too smart to believe in a literal hell. I remembered when I was a child, there was a rock band that 
did a lot of drugs. The name of the band was Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Ron, you may remember them. They wrote a song, and I, I looked up the words. And the song came off of their album called When I Was Young, and the name of the song is And When I Die. I'm not scared of dying, and I don't really care if it's peace you find in dying. Let the time be near. If it's peace you find in dying, when then the dying time is here, just bundle up my coffin because it's cold down there. Yeah, it's cold down there. Yeah, it's crazy cold up down there. But I'm here to tell you it's not cold. And whatever sick-minded young person wrote that song, they had no clue of what hell was really about. For some people, hell has frozen over, and it's crazy cold down there. Walk into any church just about in America, and you'll find that hell has been frozen out of the pulpit, including this one. Most preachers, including myself, don't even mention hell anymore. It is true that we should offer hope. That's what the church is about. We should offer hope. We shouldn't be condemning. We shouldn't be judging. We shouldn't be pointing our finger. And if you're pointing your finger at somebody else in this room, you don't belong here. We're not finger pointing. We're not here to accuse. We're not here to backbite. We're not here to sow discord. But we are here to understand. We should offer hope. We should never preach damnation. But the fact is most people think that God is too good, and I'm going to prove that he's not. Most people think that God is too good to allow a hell. I have preached no telling how many funeral services. I've never preached one when uh, I've never walked to the pulpit and said, our dear brother is going straight to hell. God bless him. If I think that, I am very careful to avoid the subject at all costs. I don't want my tires slashed and death threats. Because most people think God's too good to allow a hell. But I think what we really need, and I really do believe this, I think we need a little bit of good old-fashioned hellfire and brimstone preaching. And I know what somebody's saying is, preacher, you don't scare me. Well, I'm not here to scare you. There's too much technology out there. Uh, how many of you remember the first time? Did you anybody ever see Jaws? Did you see it? Come on, if you saw Jaws, wave your hand. The first time I saw Jaws, that's when I stopped taking baths and started taking showers. Scared me to death. What's that tune? Yeah, somebody help me. I'm, I'm tone deaf, but you all got it. Gives me goosebumps. But then the, the other day it came on, and I, I kind of flipped over and, and watched a little bit of it, and it was so corny. I'm like, how could that scare me? That's so lame. But t technology has advanced. You want to get scared, just turn on the commercials. Those, those horror movie commercials, I'm like, I can't watch that. Do you want to get scared? You can do that. You, I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to present to you some facts and then let you deal with the reality of the truth. You cannot make a decision, the right decision, the proper decision, until you have all the facts. And this particular pulpit apologizes to you for not presenting you with all the facts. God is a God of mercy. He's a God of grace, but he's also a God of judgment. I only wish I could scare you, but I can't. But you must know before you leave here today that there is a hell, and you cannot freeze it out of your mind. 13% of those words written in red mention hell. 
As I said earlier, 1,870 verses in the Bible mention hell. Hell is mentioned in the Scripture more than any other subject. We preach about hope, and we should. But hell is real, and we should preach about it too. Over one half of the parables that Jesus spoke mentioned judgment or eternal punishment. Let me give you some of the references in the Scripture, what the Lord said about hell. He said in Matthew, he was talking about the wedding garment. And those that didn't have the proper wedding garment would be cast to where there is weeping, eternal darkness, and weeping and gnashing of teeth. He talked about in Matthew chapter 5 the place called Gehenna or the garbage dump where the fire never dies. It always burns. The Lord talked about hell as a place of bondage and prison. He talked about hell as a pit. In the King James, it's called the bottomless pit. In other versions, it's called the great abyss. When, G, when Just as an example, you'll remember when Jesus cast the demons out of the Gadarene. Remember the man from Gadarene that, that had the devils inside of him and the Lord cast them out. He came tearing himself and the Lord cast the demons out of this man. And what did the demons beg the Lord not to do? He said, please don't throw us into the pit. Job describes hell as darkness. Peter describes hell as complete darkness. Jesus describes hell, and this scares me to death, as a place of regret. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is it quenched. In Psalms chapter 11, David mentioned that the Lord would rain fiery coals down on the wicked just like he did in Sodom and Gomorrah. That wasn't Satan that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was God. Isaiah said, hell is deep and it's large and God's breath ignites it. No wonder, Jesus said, that we ought not to fear man. We ought not to fear someone that could just destroy the body, but we should fear God. As a matter of fact, he said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why? Because God is the only one that can destroy the body and cast the soul into hell. No wonder Jesus said it's better to pluck your eye out, to cut off your hand, or to cut off your leg than to go to hell. I didn't bring a saw this morning, but I probably should have. And if you don't hear anything else I say, I want you to hear this. The one who makes heaven, heaven, is the same one who makes hell, hell. Heaven will be a place of perfect mercy and perfect grace. And hell will be the opposite. Hell will be a place of pure judgment. The pure of heart will be in heaven and the impure will be in hell. Hell is outside of God's mercy and out of the reach of his grace, but inside of his wrath and his anger. He said, well, God's not in hell. He's not in hell. Well, he created everything. And the psalmist David said, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. Oh, he's there. God's in hell. But he's there as a God of judgment. And I'm almost finished. It is, hell is an unbelievably 
horrible, ghastly, evil place that even the most sick-minded person couldn't imagine. Heaven is such a wonderful, glorious place that even the most wonderful thoughts can't imagine. Hell has not cooled down one degree, and it has enlarged itself. Did you hear me? I said hell is no cooler today than it was when people couldn't read. Hell is no cooler today than it was 100 years ago or 50 years ago. Just because we quit preaching about it didn't cool it down. In 1965, this is a strange statistic, and I really don't get it, but I'm going to read it anyway. In 1965, 56% of people believed in hell. USA Today just did a poll, and 78% of people now believe in hell. But only 6% of people think that they're going there. Think that they might go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I don't want you to be offended at this scripture, but till we get to the end, okay? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, none of those will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers. Go to verse 11. And such were some of you. I fit in several of those. If you were to back it up, and for you to say you don't, you just made yourself a liar, and that's one of those. We all fit into verse number 9 and verse number 10. But we've been washed. Don't you judge anybody just because you've been washed because you're just like them. Only difference is, is you've been to the water. Don't you judge anybody that makes a mistake just because you've been washed. This has got to be one of my favorite scriptures, but I've been, I, was, I was like that. But I've been washed. I've been sanctified. I didn't deserve it. I've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Somebody shout to the Lord and with a spirit of thanksgiving today. Yeah, idolaters and adulterers. And what, what are you trying to say? Narrow it down to easy Arkansas English. Anyone who puts anything in front of God will be there. If it's money, if it's sex, if it's sports, if it's leisure. And you know the one that's going to be there that I hate worse than anything? It's the, you remember the seven sins the Lord hates? You know which sin he hates the worst? The Hebrews did it backwards. They started with the least important and ended with the most important. And the seven sins that God hates, the one he hates more than anything is he who sows discord among the brethren. God hates that. And the discord sowers will be in hell. And for that reason alone, I'm not interested in going. I'm going to do a lot of bad things, and I'm going to make a lot of mistakes, and I'm going to have to have that blood of Jesus to wash away my sin. But God, don't let me be guilty of being a sower of discord. Where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire, like a ringing bell, three times, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not. He wanted it to stick in your mind. When the Hebrews repeated something three times, I mean, it's very important for you to understand that in hell the worm doesn't die and the fire never stops. Can you hear him knocking at your heart? I died for you. I don't want you to go to hell. 
I died for your past. I died for your present. I died for your future. I died for your body. I died for your soul. I died for your spirit. Don't, 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 don't go to hell. You're going to have to wade through my blood and spit at me on your way to hell. <laughs> Jesus died so you wouldn't have to go to hell. Before Jesus died, we, we were all condemned to hell. But when he died, the blood fo- flowed both ways. It flowed all the way back to Adam and all the way forward to where we are today. And whosoever will, we can come and we can drink. And we can be delivered from our faults and our failures and our mistakes. <laughs> so I'm just here to tell you. That Jesus died, so you don't have to go to hell. And as I finish, I'd like to dust off an old scripture that I don't use a lot. It's probably the single most popular scripture in the whole world, John chapter 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He didn't want you to go to hell so bad. He was willing to sacrifice his own son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hell is not one single degree cooler today than it ever has been. And it is growing by leaps and bounds. And the pathway to hell, the cliff that you fall off on the way to hell, more and more people are taking that journey to the lake of fire where the worm died not and the fire is not quenched. I've on my knees just for a few minutes this morning and I asked God to give me, and I'm going to be graphic, to give me a vision of hell. And I saw my boys in a moment, the most, and when I got up, I said, oh, God, my boys can't go to hell. It's got to be that important to me. I used to leave, God, to give me a picture of hell. I didn't see my boys in there. I just, my boys flashed in front of my face. Oh, God. Tears begin to flow down my face. Let me understand. Understand. I want to fully know him as a God of mercy. I want to know him in the fullness of his suffering. I don't want one stripe that was laid on his back to be in vain for me. One strike of the hammer and the nail to be in vain for me. I want every drop. I want to soak up every drop of that blood. Every moan, I want it to be for me. I don't want it to go in vain because I want to fully know him as a God of mercy. I want to fully understand him, a God of grace. I never want to know him as a God of judgment. I don't ever want to know him in that capacity. I don't want to ever make my bed in hell and wake up and he's there. But I want to wake up in heaven. And he's the light of the city. And can I say something? And this is reality. This is not, this is not a fairy tale. This is reality. You only have two choices. You can't just decide I'm out. I'm not going to play the game. It's heaven or hell, and that's the only 
No wonder Joshua said, ask for me and my house. We're not going to hell. We will serve the Lord. Would you reach up to him as a God of mercy? So I've got to rearrange my priorities because I read it. And if anything is more important than him. Oh, I've got my weaknesses. I've got my faults. So do you. My weaknesses aren't yours and yours aren't mine. And I'd be a fool to judge you by yours. And you'd be a fool to judge me by mine. never going to be able this side of heaven to completely extinguish those things in my life it's a constant battle Paul said I have fought a good fight I never quit fighting it's always been a war it's always been a battle I'm in a constant war I'm in a constant battle but I'm not going to quit I'm not going to quit fighting to do right I'm not going to quit fighting to be better I'm not going to quit asking him to forgive me I'm not going to quit standing beneath the cross and wrapping my arms around that old rugged cross and letting that blood wash my sins away I'm not going to quit because if I quit, the worm's never going to die and the fire's never going to stop for me. And that's not a choice I'm willing to make. So i got to rearrange my priorities and I can't let anything be more important to me than God. I said I can't let anything be more important to me than Him. If somebody besides me would like to rearrange your priorities today, I want you to come down quickly and I want you to think about it. But if you just need some rearranging in your life to make sure that first things first, would you come? Would you come? They're already coming. I just want to make sure that I'm making the right choice. I wish everybody in the room would just lift your hands to him today before.
some of you are just lost and can't help it. You got to get that notion out of your head. I, uh, I grew up in a perfect childhood, wonderful environment for a kid to grow up in. Probably when I was a little kid, my, my best friend might have been my grandpa. He was mean. I heard stories my whole life about how mean my grandpa was. He just never was mean to me. He was good to me. <laughs> real, real good to me. And uh, I miss him every day. But <clears throat> I thought about <clears throat> him this morning. If half the stories I heard about my grandpa were true, then if anybody deserved hell, he did. He deserved it. If anything that I heard was true, he deserved it. Even though it was good to me, if, if those stories were true. But I got a call one day, I think it was a Tuesday afternoon, my grandpa called me and he was 80 years old. And he said, bud, I need you to come over and talk to me. And that's... Papa called you and said, come talk. That didn't mean wait. That meant getting your rear end over there right now. So that's what I did. He said, I've done a lot of bad things in my life, and I'm not going to live too much longer, and I, I just want to make sure that I'm right. And I've heard a lot of preachers say a lot of things. He said, but I don't feel right, and I just want you to tell me the truth. I don't want you to hold anything back from me. I want you to tell me the truth. And that's a very intimidating conversation with that old man. I told him the truth. I sat there and I told him the truth. And I told him we needed to repent of those sins and we needed to wash those sins away in baptism and finish that conversation. And Redis Arnold Whitley said, well, that's exactly what I'm going to do. He was 80 years old. The Bible talks about the worker at the 11th hour. that he got the same wages as the one that got there. They worked 12 hour days back in those days. And said, and I preached at his funeral, the worker at the 11th hour that Redis made his way into heaven. He didn't get there at the first hour, but he got there at the 11th hour and God covered his sins just like he did mine. Don't you let the devil trick you. Don't you let him get in your head and make you think you're not worthy. You're not worthy, but he's worthy. The question is not whether you are worthy of heaven or not. The question is Jesus worthy of heaven. If Jesus is worthy of heaven and you'll get some of his blood on you, then you'll go to heaven too. And I said, Papa, you just got to get some of Jesus' blood on you and it's going to be all right. That's why when the priest went into that holy place, he had that hyssop and he was just slinging it everywhere. I've got to get some of that blood everywhere. I got to get some of it on me. I got to give it some of it on this and everything's got to be covered in it. And that's the right choice. Ooh. Could we just worship him before we leave here? Come on, let's worship him. Let's worship him like he's in the room with us because he is. Let's worship him. Come on. I want to know you as a God of mercy. I want to know you as a God of grace.
We just, we just have to be aware of what's really going on. And I think the world has fooled us We're a lot more worried about what kind of season the football team's going to have than whether we have escaped hell or not. Our priorities are really mixed up. And I just just came to the pulpit today just to kind of rearrange my priorities a little bit. I hope it's a blessing to you. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Bring somebody to church with you always and after.